Hello, everybody. I'm Phil from One Wall Studio here, bringing you a very exciting mix walkthrough today of Heart Rage's Pyrogenesis, which should be available as of right now on pretty much all streaming platforms. And if it's not out at the time this video comes out, then I just want you to know that it will be coming out on October 4th. Go into the description below and you will find that there are links to either pre-save or find it on multiple different services for your listening pleasure. This song was written by my friend Constantine, whose band's name is Heart Rage. The, the entire song was mixed by me, and it was mastered by Tony Lindgren at Fascination Street Studios. So I, for one, am extremely excited to have worked on a track that got mastered at Fascination Street. With that in mind, let us jump straight into this track. So first thing you'll notice is that... It's actually a pretty massive session with lots of tracks, some of which I didn't use the DIs of because I thought the tones were perfect. I've got references. I've got the original demo to keep me focused on what really matters in this track. It was the artist who mixed the original demo. I wanted to ensure that the original intention was kept in focus while I was working on uh, mixing it to just translate better, if that makes sense. So first things first, let's give it a little bit of listen from here, this little fun part right here. Now let's do my favorite thing and turn off all processing. So first things first, let's jump into the drums because I'm a big fan of how the drums came out. So I happen to know for a fact that the drums that were being utilized were actually crim drums from Jens Bagren, who coincidentally works at Fascination Street Studios. My geeking aside, let's jump into these cymbals because I really like how they sound by default. Now with my processing, and I'll walk you through what I did. So first things first, the EQ. Now you'll notice that with the EQ, I did a little bit of a high pass. I cut with a shelf at around 600 hertz, and here's why. You hear a lot of the, the body of the drums in the room. And if you get rid of it, it lets the cymbals come up a little bit and pushes the shells down just a tiny bit. And there's a reason for that. Now, I also removed these resonances with relatively musical cuts. So while they sound good on their own, they definitely sound very harsh once everything else is in there, and it's competing with a lot of elements with a lot of high end, including the shells themselves. So the 8K, the 5K, the 2.5K, those are all places where the shells are hitting, and the 1.5K is where the toms are at. So really what I'm doing here is I'm deadening the shells a little bit so that, again, the cymbals can come out. So let's do an AB. You hear how much shell is in the overheads, and that's fine. But when I'm processing everything overall, I kind of want a lot of that shell sound to go away so that the shells themselves can hit harder. It's basically like a symbols only filter. All right, so then I also have this tape plugin from Softube. And I am pushing it just a little bit into the red there during the loudest parts. Using B, color amount, just a little bit there, like 7.4 out of 10. Then I've got the tape speed of 15 ips. And I'm not doing anything to the high end, anything to the stability, anything at all. This is just a little bit of color that only occasionally does a little bit of distortion. So it really just gels the whole thing together because this symbols bus 
is actually a combination of the spots and the overheads. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to gel the spot mics a little bit into the overhead mics, which is a little bit of distortion and a little bit of EQ there. Up next, and this is going to be a major change to the volume, I've got a 33609 style compressor. Really catching the, uh, the shells, the peaks from the snare and so on. I've got a fixed attack, which is very fast because this is a very old school Neve uh, diode compressor with a 400 millisecond recovery time, which is basically going to be your release. It's super slow. I'm also using it as a massive gain boost because at this point I've done a lot of cutting and a little bit of gelling, but really haven't been giving it a lot of volume. It's a four to one ratio. Even though it says the limiting is in, it's really not going to be touching anything limiter wise because it's just not loud enough yet. And I'm boosting the game by 12 dB. So you're going to get a decent amount of gain reduction to gel the overheads and the cymbals. But I'm also bringing up overall room tone with a slow release to give that like snare tail just a little bit more intimacy. And up next, I have Dan Korneff's L Juan limiter to bring the overall volume up quite considerably and to smash the overheads a bit. So overall, they now have a very washy, very crushed sound. Basically just a cymbals tame bleed preset. So before, after. Notice how you now have a lot of the ring of the room and the shells and the cymbals kind of working together as opposed to, for example, if I didn't have the EQ. That's a lot of shell. So yeah, every step basically just builds on the last, creates a much more cohesive overhead sound. Now then, on to the shells. First things first, let's play with the kick here. Because these were already crim drums, I felt it appropriate to use uh, Bagren digital style drums as well by blending them in on a trigger track. So let me show how that sounds. Here's the trigger track. So you can hear a couple of dry, a couple of wet just to give it some more room, a little bit more realism on the, uh, the sample. Because in real drums, the, the sample is never that dry, or the microphone, rather, is really not going to be that dry. You're going to be picking up a little bit of room tone, and a lot of people try to get away from that. But when you combine these two things, these two different drum sounds, the original sub kick, the original in kick and then more Bogren samples, you get a very full, very punchy sound. And I like the blend of all of these together. One thing you'll notice is that I did automation for the intro so that the kick really punches out of the intro and then punches out here when the kick is standing alone. But when the fast kicks come in, I drop the volume significantly and I do a lot to tame the low end. So here's all of the processing on the kick. Oh yeah. First things first, EQ. I do have a boost in the low a little bit. Cutting this resonance here. Let me show you all the things I'm cutting. Hear that woof? Cleaned it up a lot because they get in the way of everything in this area. And I'm boosting a little bit here at around 1K. Too much of it, and it sounds kind of funky, but not enough. And there's no knock to it anymore. It kind of gets lost in the sauce. So I like a little bit of that mid-range so that the kick can feel a lot closer to you. Then I boosted a little bit at 3K, cut a little bit at 4K, and boosted some high end at 8K. So without, with, 
Notice how it really just shapes the tone a little bit more consistently. Up next, I have this compressor here. Basically doing four to one. Never really doing more than like six dB of gain reduction, which is a considerable amount. But consider it's a relatively uh, fast attack and a relatively fast release because it's kick. And I wanted to just stay fairly consistent in terms of volume. After that compressor, I have Saturn doing some saturation, mostly in this band here between 800 hertz and 2K. This band right here, that's that knock that I was trying to isolate with the EQ a little bit, but I'm driving it a lot harder with a tape distortion and also the high end with tape distortion. Hear that click come back into focus? There's a little bit of tape distortion on everything and a lot of uh, carving out of that sub 100 here. To really focus in on the stuff I don't want and get rid of it and then focus in on the that little bit of like higher area around, around 1K so that there's a transition into the next band. So Saturn makes a huge difference on this one. Notice how it almost comes like closer to you. I really want that kick to be present throughout the whole song because you don't want the kick work to get lost. It is really good kick work. And I have a little bit of multi-band compression being done here. Never really doing more than like one or two dB on the really long parts with a slow attack and a slow release so that when it hits hard, it doesn't really clamp down until after the transient. But then during the long sections, it's controlling and taming that low end a lot more. Without it, it's a much more consistent rumble almost. But with, you can bring up everything else in volume and get more of the click without as much of the rumble being as uh, powerful. Because rumble gets distracting very quickly in a track with as much low end content as this. Lastly, I have JST Clip, just clipping the track. Three or four dB, but it's not really because the uh, output isn't really peaking there. I'm really more or less clipping like one dB off the top. Yeah. So one to two dB of actual clipping and then the trim set at negative one. And that's the kick drum without with out with now that that's set let's go on to the snare snare same deal I was mostly using Bogren digital samples and one mix wave Luke Holland top sample so you can actually hear in the trigger sample I used there's plenty of room because I don't necessarily want it to be all direct. Again, because I like a little bit more of a roomy snare. Uh, and then I also got these, the Crim Drum samples, from the original session. They're very close, very dry. Lots of ring to them. So when combined with the sample that I used, suddenly it's a very roomy snare, a very big snare. Even though it's got plenty of smack and it's very dry still. Uh, there's a little bit more room. Now, there's a secret to how I get around that, right? How it's not just a super drowned out snare the whole time. So here's how I did that from the very beginning. And this is definitely just part of my workflow because it's something I enjoy the feeling of. So first things first, I did quite a bit of EQ here. Uh, I did a little bit of a boost at 9k a little bit of a boost at like 7k just to musically like push up this area cut a little bit at 4k because I didn't like the, there was a slight like plasticky sound I wasn't enjoying and then I have a 5.8 dv shelf boost at like 6 kilohertz so let me show you what that's like cutting some of the resonance here at 500 hertz and 300 hertz because that rings really loud 
boost it a little bit over here with a resonant filter at like 185 hertz. Boosted some of this 1.5K so that it stands out in the mix and a little bit of that 2K because without it, it just sounds so scooped. So you get a little bit more of that paper sound, but it also stays in your face. So between the kick and the snare, you've got this consistent mid-range that can punch you, especially down the center. This 4K it might not have been super necessary, however, there was a ring there, like a papery sustain that I didn't like. And then, of course, if I were to just get rid of these, Where'd all the high end go? So there we go. A nice punchy, cracky snare. And to top it off, regular compression. Really just taming it so that it doesn't like go too hard, especially on these sections that have little fast uh, rolls. It brings them down a little bit more because I have that slower release of like 100 milliseconds. So you have a little bit more push and pull on the compression and it kind of helps uh, even out the post transient sustain or decay. Notice how it almost focuses the transient because it hits after 25 milliseconds and then pulls away. So it creates this like hit suck release. I really like that effect on snare and it makes me feel like it, it makes the snare sound punchier without actually doing much to it. It's almost like a psychoacoustic punchiness. So here's Saturn. The difference it made was immense. So I did push a little bit of tape drive on the, the low end, everything below like 340 hertz, 360. Really EQ'd things differently on the, the band between 360 and 1K. Notice how I really shape it a lot more. And then here we have everything between 1K and 3K. This area. Actually, the secret is this little dynamics knob. So I actually reduced the sustain very aggressively on this mid band. So that you still get that smack. But it doesn't last too long. Like, look at this. Hear that ring? Yeah, I didn't like that. So I sucked that ring out while still in leaving the transient. And the same thing here. This mid-range band where all of the, the smack is of like the head sound. This is where a lot of that room ring is. So just getting rid of that makes it sound like a less roomy sample while still having that initial room impact that that makes it sound like the snare is breathing in a room but the transient is still focused same thing here especially between 3k and 7k because that's where all of the room sample really rings out but I don't want the room sample to ring out forever I just want it to provide initial transient because we have room tracks with the snares in it and I love the more natural sounding room tracks that came out of Crim Drummer. So I'm going to use those for the sustain and I'm going to use these direct mics with the smaller room samples or with the more uh, quick room samples and blend that into the, uh, the shells bus. So this is what it would sound like if I'd let it be really sustain heavy. But now you get a much more controlled room that has a very short sustain while it still makes it sound like the snare is breathing. And then I have the same thing on the top end, though not as much, with a little bit of a treble boost there. Keep in mind, I am distorting all of these just a little bit with some tape saturation. But the super high end would be very distracting if I didn't cut some of that sustain out of it. Notice how it just kind of rings. I don't like it. So without Saturn, it's very ringy with 
no ring, a little bit of room sound, and lots of punch. Up next, I also have that low end compression going on here and a little bit of this upper mid range compression between like two and 5k just to cut down a tiny bit on what I heard was like a click so that when it gets really bad, it just controls that click a little bit by like one and a half dB. And then the low end is a slow attack, slow release, so that if you start to do like a blast or some roll, it just tames that low end a little bit. Lastly, I have a clipper on it, and quite frankly, since it really only went up to like negative six, negative seven dB at most on some of the harder hits, uh, I pushed it a lot harder on here, which allows it to really smack that transient. You know what I mean? So without any processing, we've got with, and you got that really pronounced high end that's really going to punch through everything, make it real good. So now that we've got our kick and our snare basically queued up, Let's get these toms going. Everybody loves toms. And I do really like these toms. They're very punchy. I didn't feel a need to sample replace them or anything. I just did some processing. Oh yeah. So first things first, only a little bit of EQ necessary. Cut some 400 and some 700. Primarily because they had kind of like a gung, 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 like a fartiness to them almost, which they're really well recorded because I only needed to do a little bit of cutting. Also boosted a little bit here around 60 hertz just because I like how that low tom sounded with it. And I do like to process toms as a bus. So I boosted a little bit here for the for that Tom for that head sound a little bit of 5k and a little bit of 9k if I were to cut them eh, the toms just disappear but if I boost them too much it almost sounds ridiculous and unnatural so for now I'm going with the more natural sounding toms because I feel like they fit better in the mix so Pro C2, I'm doing some compression. Same 25 millisecond attack as the other toms, or as the uh, kick and the snare, but the release is sh uh, longer than both. Because that impact thing that the snare had going for it, I really like, but I also want this to be a little bit more graded if there's a lot of tom work going on. So I wanted to clamp down on it just a little bit so the toms don't get super out of hand. With Saturn, I'm really pushing the lows a little bit here and really driving just the really highs and the really lows just to give it a little bit more excitement. And of course, I'm boosting the top end a little bit here just in the presence area and not doing much else except also controlling this section. I'm giving it a little bit of that drive, but I'm also carving out some of the low, low mids and boosting a little bit more in that high area. So without... With... So it's all very subtle, but it's really just emphasizing the parts that I really liked from the EQ, but doing it with saturation instead of just EQ. I also have that low end control here, so that when it goes real hard, or if there's like a roll, it controls that low end before it explodes too much. And again, just a clipper. Really only clipping some of the heavier transients so that it brings things up more consistently and saturates instead of limiting. So now you've got these punchy as heck toms, which are all just the stock crim toms, and I love them.
Now here's the shells bus, which the kick, snare, and toms are all run to. First things first, I'd have this tape machine that's actually saturating pretty hard, especially on the tom hits. I'm not doing anything besides just using the tape for a little bit of push. Very subtle, but I like how it smears the snare a little bit. I have this multiband compressor controlling that low end while also boosting it. Again, slowish attack, but then relatively fast release. And I'm multiband compressing everything in the shells bus together. So kicks, snare, toms are all going to this with this high and low shelf boost while also clamping down on this mid range a little bit. Listen to what happens if I don't clamp down on those. And with. Now it feels like nothing's poking out too much. And to also control a little bit of that poke, I have this compressor again. 10 millisecond attack though this time, still 4 to 1, 100 millisecond recovery time, and only doing ever so slight amounts of gain reduction. Like literally no more than 2 dB at most, unless there's like a massive uptick in volume. All because I really enjoy the sound of it. Just ever so slightly poking down. But the cumulative effect of all of these small little effects is Notice how without it all feels way too forward This sets it in its place a little bit in the mix and is going to help it blend better with the overheads So, ear refresher from where we were before. And back. Cool, so I'd like to think we've made some positive progress. Up next is the entire drums bus. So what this encapsulates is just the cymbals and the shells buses individually routed into this drum bus with a little bit of protection from a limiter, another compressor to help them gel a little bit and the same exact thing I had before. So just some tape. Because I love the cumulative effect of like the little tape things. I also did another instance of this multiband compressor. Same deal, but this time I really loosened up on the attack time and brought the release time even faster with again some more uh, range control of the low end. So with all of this multiband compression going on, you're really bringing down the low end uh, when it's aggressive while also bringing up the overall low end of everything in between. Small stages of multiband compression make a huge difference in my opinion. Because now everything feels like it sits real nice. So I threw one more bus compressor on this, this is the townhouse compressor. Set the side chain filter to about 110 hertz so that the kick drum doesn't aggressively go after it. But with a ratio of four to one and an attack time of 30 milliseconds and a release of 100 milliseconds, I was able to get like two dB of compression and then makeup out of it to really blend everything nice. to bring up that overall aggression of the drums. And lastly, I used Pro-L with a one millisecond attack time and a release of one second. Ordinarily, I wouldn't do something like that, but to be honest, it felt right almost. It almost felt to me like uh, side chaining the snare to the overheads because it brings everything down. So when the snare hits really hard, everything seems to move out of its way. And I love that feeling. This is actually more than I'd usually limit the drums, but it, it worked for this mix. So I liked it. Without. With. 
And now, my friends, it's at a point where it sits very nicely in the mix. Trust me, bro. So on to the next part, we have these room tracks here, which were also baked out from Crim Drums. So these are basically just being designed to fit nicely behind the room, the real drum kit. So first things first, I did some soothing. You may not be able to hear it much, but it does sound a little bit harsh in this upper area. And I really don't want it to do that because then it gets in the way of the impact of the shells. So again, at like 5K, about 10K, I have it de-resonancing just for like the, the ring after stuff. Because I don't want the rooms to ring too much. Especially once I start crushing things. I also am using this tape machine again. And just because it was on the other stuff, right? So I wanted a little bit of consistency with the drum bus, so I just threw the tape machine on there. Even though I didn't even bother to calibrate it at, like, level. I just, I threw it on there. Because I can. So I did this multiband compression. Which uses some of the same crossover points, like the 10k to 1k, 200 hertz to 1k. But like, I really made the attack times fast and the release times relatively slow, with the exception of the high end, so that the cymbals can kind of cut through without being too distressed. But I also lowered them in volume. So I lowered the really lows and the really highs because they're really just going to get in the way. Uh, for a room track like this, I kind of do just want uh, mid-range, like the room to be mid-range E. The reason I'm doing this such a fast attack and such a slow release though on everything is so that the transients of the room samples don't get in the way of the initial direct hits from the dry shells. And that includes from the, the room samples that I baked into the triggered shells. So without... with really clamped down and really just causing it to be uh, more focused. So I also did a little bit of compression here, but at a 10 to one ratio, it's hard not to get higher rates. One, like 0.1 millisecond attack time, automatic release. And especially now you can hear what a difference this uh, multiband will make. It sounds nice, but it won't fit behind the drums as well. Now it'll fit much nicer behind the drums. And then finally, I limited the crap out of it. And this is another example where that multiband compressor will make a huge difference. Without. With. I also automated the room tracks to be higher during this section because I felt as though we really needed that for the uh, the first chorus because it gives it like an explosive room that just pops in and just sounds so good. I don't have more room for the rest of it because other elements start to take over throughout the song. But as I was building the mix, I really just wanted that first one to be really explosive. Speaking of explosive, I have this snare verb here that's literally just a plate reverb. 24 millisecond pre-delay. That only comes in during the choruses. Original snare. Plate. That pre-delay helps it to not step over the initial attack of anything else because the one thing I really wanted in this track was to maintain very clean transients. I then smashed this chorus uh, snare reverb through a distressor with a very fast attack and a relatively slow release. Four to one, some saturation, some warmth. Without the saturation, it's a very clean compression with a little bit of distortion with that saturation and warmth it's really just shelving off the highs a little bit to give it more upper mid focus 
Again, don't want to get in the way of like the rooms. And the saturation just distorts it ever so slightly. And then I smashed it with a limiter. To give it like an explosive feel, but also to cut down on that initial transient so that it blends way better with the real snare. So it almost like steps out of the way of the snare. Without that, it almost feels like it still hits a little bit too aggressively with the snare, even though it's at a lower volume. This lets it come up in volume and give it an explosive chorus feel, while also letting the snare have an initial transient that actually sounds really good. So that's the snare verb that only exists during the chorus. Up next, I have this parallel compression going on, which is really just the shells boosting up here in the highs to give it more click, compressing it, letting the initial transient through, and then releasing relatively fast, giving it some saturation and warmth again. It's a 10 to 1 ratio on a distressor. And then we have this limiter here doing this uh, pretty fast smash, actually. So it can get nice and clicky and then nice and punchy, but with the limiter, I'm also bringing up a little bit of that initial uh, booty of it, so to speak. So this is a very smashed parallel compression. But with that, what you get out of it is that it just punches a little bit harder through everything else. So once all of the guitars and uh, layers of orchestration are there, that little bit of parallel compression on the, the drum shells even at negative 30 dB are still going to be making a huge difference in how it translates across systems, especially smaller systems. Up next, I have the Prim drums themselves. I actually did take the MIDI for it. And I used it as a source for the trigger files, uh, for the trigger with the MIDI here. But I also just smashed it a little bit. So this is basically another parallel compression, but with like the original drum sampler. I just didn't bother to get rid of it because I didn't feel the need to. So it was just sitting there at like negative 32 dB. No big deal. It's the same thing, but at least it sounds good in context. So up next, I have the bass tracks. So these sounded really good. And originally I didn't use the DI at all, but eventually, uh, I was asked for more grit, so I just used the DI with Audio Assault Clank, pushed the drive, really high past it, uh, pushed up the mids and the treble a lot, made it a harsh circuit, kept the default cab, and didn't do anything else. So this is just purely crushing the, the signal of the DI. With the DI, without, with. So you notice how it just brings the aggression forward a little bit. So now here's all of the bass processing that was done. It gets a little tricky because I like bass. First things first, I EQ'd it a lot around here. These are all the frequencies I cut. You can tell why. Also cut a little bit of 2K. Not because it sounds bad, but because uh, there's a lot of stuff going on at 2K in this track. And I didn't want it to get in the way of the vocals or the guitars. Or the drums. So it was a necessary sacrifice. Also low pass it at like 5.5 kilohertz and high pass it at like 45 hertz. So without the EQ. With... Cleaned it up a lot. Ran it through the tape machine with a lot more harmonic distortion. And that's about it. I just really enjoyed the tape. 
Up next, I ran Track Spacer from the kick. So the kick is sidechained to the bass, and anything under 114 hertz is getting stepped on a little bit. You can barely even tell most of the time because I have it set to like a 0.12 millisecond attack, 15 millisecond release. But if you have a really good low end reproduction, like in a subwoofer on your system, you'll definitely notice that it, it makes a huge difference. Up next, I have this multiband compression. It actually is showing the side chained kick as well, which is fun. So here I'm boosting everything below 97 hertz while also controlling it ever so slightly with a slow attack, fastish release. I'm also controlling the mids here. Everything between 100 hertz and like 1,000. But then everything between 1,000 and 10,000, I'm just straight up boosting and then having like a really fast clamp down. So it's really controlling that area and focusing on it while also preventing it from getting too clanky. Without. With. It helps it sit a little bit nicer in the mix. And then I also did an overall compression, saturated it even harder. Fastest attack, fast-ish release, four to one. Basically doing it 1176 style, but with a distressor. Bringing some of that rumble in there. And then I limited it. But not actually super hard, just a little bit, just to get it up to level. Fast attack, slowish release, and a dynamic style. So really, I'm just leveling the bass out. Importantly, now we know that the drums and the bass blend well. I love that drum and bass section. Up next, we have these rhythm guitars, which sounded great out of the gate. So let's do this during a really chuggy section. First things first, I EQ'd them. Just wanted to isolate this little bit here. Where it goes, because it sounded kind of gross. Same thing here. That let me focus a lot more on this upper mid range. and this really aggressive part while also cutting a this this one resonance right here i didn't like it if i increased it it would get annoying quick but everything around it sounded great so without the eq it sounds very full but now it sounds aggressive. Again, tape, this time actually boosting more high end with the tape and very aggressively distorting with it. Notice how the air comes up. Multi-band compressor just clamping down a little bit, especially on this mid-range area while also boosting by 1 dB everything above 1K and boosting air above 10K. So now the guitar sits a little bit cleaner in the mix while also still being more aggressive in terms of frequency. Yeah. 
You may not like how it sounds in solo, but once you're in the mix, it'll definitely breathe a lot more with the drums and bass. So you'll hear everything very clearly because it's a little bit more recessed. So I also actually used this compressor on it. Two to one. Moderately fast attack and fast release, but mostly just this warmth knob here and a little bit of saturation from the output stage as opposed to like distortion. That really pushes the mids back up a little bit and gives it a little bit more focus. And here is the limiter. Fast attack, relatively fast release, like 150 millisecond release, and fairly dynamic. So these are actually very limited, which is fine, but like once you hear the difference between on and off, it's a great tone, but I'm really just shaping it around the rest of the mix at this point and giving it a little bit more of that bite so that it stands out nice. The other thing that's important to mention is that I have this rhythm track, right? Rhythm two. So this is what the other tone sounds like. Very thick, and I wanted to play to its strengths with the processing. So I like really cut out a lot of the highs and the lows. So otherwise there's too much going on in the bass and kick area. This is where the snare is. This is where a lot of the background elements are going to be. And this is where the vocals are going to sit. This is going to be this massive peak at 1K to really give the guitars this wraparound feel. And I'm cutting some of the resonances that were actually kind of obnoxious after I did that. But I did boost immensely here at 5K. So that the air of it really sticks to your face. So if I were to just completely do the opposite of everything I did. You get a lot of these funky tones that are mostly just resonance. And I know that sounds extreme because it is, but believe me, you'll hear it later. Now tape, very aggressively distorting, very aggressively boosting the highs. I almost want it to be like chainsaw in that top end. Multi-band compression. Treating this whole area with intense, like letting the transients through and then releasing it after that transients to give the pick attack the opportunity to shine again. Also taming that low end below 170 hertz a little more and raising that high end a lot. So now it's a little bit more controlled, but a lot more pick attacky. And then here's the distressor again. Same settings as the other one. I just really like the distortion of it. And limiter. Now, yes, that's a lot. However, I take it from this relatively clean and bassy tone to something that's absolutely distorted, broken up, destroyed, but I love how it blends between the two of them. Notice how they just sound massive now. They like super fill each other up. Let's go from there. Like I said, a lot of layers here. Here's the first thing I did with the solo guitar, which sounds great, by the way. So with no processing, that sounds kind of fu uh, funny, but believe me, I did what I did for a reason. So here we go. First things first, I brightened the heck out of this and also gave it a little bit of sub harmonic, actually. With, because I really wanted that pick attack to come out. So in the interest of that, I also boosted a lot around 1K, 
cut a whole bunch of this stuff around here where the, the background elements are really taking over, like everything from 300 hertz to like 700 hertz is going to have a lot of that background stuff. And I keep referring to the background stuff. I mean, like the orchestration, big old boost at five and a half K, a little bit of a, a low pass at like 12 K. And then I'm high passing it all the way up to like 170 hertz. Sometimes I don't go that aggressive, but for this one, it was already a very thick tone. Notice how I'm focusing it again. And same with the tape. Very aggressively hitting the distortion on the tape. This is the total harmonic distortion meter, by the way, now. So it's like in the red. And pushing those highs up. So that tape makes a huge difference. Then I'm focusing up on the upper mids again. Again, letting the transient through with a relatively fast release. Because I still wanted that to be like articulated all the way to the end, even though I want to control the parts where it gets really gnarly. I love the parts in the beginning when it's super dark. So as it gets more and more gnarly, this upper band actually clamps down on it more. But in the early parts, when there's like virtually no upper mid range, it pushes that stuff up. So this multiband compression is doing a lot of work here, but it saves me time with other tools. Up next, I have the compression. Again, this is a little more aggressive. But like, I love this compressor because it really does bring out a lot of that lower mid range stuff that I've been scooping out and just like saturates from the low end to bring some of that back. Slayer style, I love it. And then limiting. <laughs> So that, combined with everything else so far, without, with, I love it so much. All right, so there's also a lead guitar part that plays during the choruses. It's actually two different sections, and about 50% left and 50% right. On the left, I put this delay to make it feel like there was more going on than there is. Literally just a straight eighth note with some ducking. And a little bit of reverb diffusion at about 30%. And then on the right side, I actually gave it a chorus because I wanted to recess it a little bit while also making it feel really wide and giving it some like high end, almost uh, singing. So I really liked it. It's got like a 16 millisecond delay. It also kind of gives it a little bit more stereo depth from the right to the left. I didn't need to do it, but I felt like it fit really well with the flow of the song. And it's just one less very dry guitar, you know? So this is kind of the wall of sound aspect of the chorus here. So what I did to give it that wall of sound vibe is I EQ'd it basically contrary to every other guitar. So if I boosted 1K in any other guitar, I cut it here. If I have the background elements interrupting, they're cut here. Like... Let me just undo everything I did for the these parts. Just some resonance and like body. This is a background element for the choruses. And then we've got the tape. Again, driving it pretty hard. Not boosting anything this time, but still driving it pretty hard. And the multiband compression is very isolating. Pulling out all this 
anything from like 250 hertz all the way up to like 3K is clamped down so as to avoid stepping on any of the other chorus elements while also increasing the air so you feel it more than you hear it. Just a little bit of compression on this one. And limiting. So that may sound crazy, but listen to the difference that this makes in the chorus. Notice how even though it's more centered, it feels like it's around you somewhere. Like it's in your stereo field, but like it's almost less placeable because it's got this ethereal feel to it that's simultaneously recessed and also peaking around the edges. And a lot of that is just due to the EQ and multiband compression choices of making it sit behind the mix almost while also peaking out over the top of it with this high shelf and a little bit of that like 8K. So it almost feels like when the snare hits, especially. It almost draws attention to that 8K from the snare is like pulling your ears towards that little 8K sizzle from the, the verse guitar or the, the lead guitars that are going on during the chorus. So I just thought that was a fun little uh, psychoacoustic thing to play with. So here we get to the fun part, the orchestration. It's mostly just choir at the level that I was asked to do it. I was like told, you know, uh, over the course of the mix notes, more of this, less of that. And I automated it quite a bit throughout the song. Now this sounds nice, but it needs to sound epic. So first thing I did was again this clarisonics which is like a saturator and harmonic exciter give it a little more of that clarity and a little bit more of that subsonic frequency then boosted some of the places i've been cutting from the other stuff with the exception of the vocals here the vocal ranges here so that the main vocals can go over them but like down here at the 400 hertz ish area I did boost and I boosted a lot of this air frequency up here. Notice how it pulls back and goes around your ears now. So I really like that. Here's some tape. Again, distorting the tape. But that's all it's doing is just driving the tape pretty hard. Here's some multiband compression again. Just so that when everything hits at different times, it clamps down on the stuff that's the most intimate while letting the air through. So that if any part gets pretty aggressive, this will keep it in line. The cumulative difference of the EQ and the multiband compression. This eats up a lot of headroom in the mix, this area here. So now it sits around everything else here, which is very nice. And then I actually used a uh, compact style limiter on it to bring up that massive room feel with a two to one ratio and a very fast release and about a 2.5 millisecond attack time, you can really hear the decay. And then of course I limited the whole bus. To further emphasize that. And I also gave it like a 200 millisecond release time uh, because I really wanted it to not distort on the limiter. I just wanted it to get like aggressive. So these are really smashed because it's it's the main chorus elements, you know? Like I wanted it to, to really stand out, especially during this breakdown. <laughs> Notice 
notice how now they stand out behind, around, and above the rhythm guitars. So the rhythm guitars are chugging and the drums are just punching real hard. And now you have all this orchestration that sits really well behind and around them. And the vocals are still going to be able to punch out. That's what a lot of this uh, tight EQ and multiband compression is helping me do is just make sure that everything has a space where everything else plays nicely. After that, I actually did the SFX bus, which is really simple stuff, right? So this is all the impacts and the whooshes and the the crazy fun things that people love to play with uh, as, you know, post-production. So what I did was I don't like to waste a lot of time when I mix. So I gave everything that was SFX to this SFX bus, just gain staged it, uh, dropped some clip volume, listened for what was doing what, did some panning stuff to give things like a feeling of movement. Some of it's baked in, some of the envelopes I actually left visible, but I, I closed a lot of them. So this was mostly just a lot of fun stuff. And a lot of it wasn't standing out against the now very aggressive mix. So I use this harmonic enricher again, or harmonic exciter, to increase the clarity, which is just the high end. Notice how is much punchier than now it almost feels like a smack. I also did a lot of the same filter control because a lot of people don't realize uh, SFX takes up a lot of spectral area, uh, especially with varied and diverse spectral uh, content. So everything from these risers to impacts, slams, cuts, all of it. I wanted to give it similar sonic area. So I boosted up around here at like 12K. And then I also cut a lot of the areas that are already being impacted by drums so that when the drums hit and these hit at the same times, they're not conflicting or creating way too much content at like 5K or 10K. So everything's there pretty effectively. And then I mostly just boosted this for some of the more uh, spooky stuff, the risers, the... the tonally cool stuff. And I also put on this like really hard brick wall high pass at like almost 40 hertz because some of these things go so low, they were eating up so much headroom. So to cut that at the bottom, I, I made sure uh, that when they hit, they weren't going to just make the whole mix pump. From there, more tape. You know it. Yeah. And then multiband compression. Again, this time it's relatively tame multiband compression just to even out the differences between all these disparate textures and impacts. And all of it is relatively slow attack, slow release, and none of it's really going more than like 3 dB so that this really controls the whole bus. And uh, then I'm using this compact style again, which mostly only gets triggered really hard for like these big boys here. Fifty millisecond release, twenty-five millisecond attack time. Again, I'm just trying to massage things. And then here's the limiting. Ordinarily, I would have cut those thips, but they actually went really well with the music. So, so here's the deal. I like the impacts, but I didn't want them to get in the way of the instruments. So it's a very fast attack and relatively slow release, so that it sounds like the impact is more distant the rollout or the fallout from the impact is less distant. So it's almost going like, you know, uh, that gives it a more cinematic feel in my opinion. And here's a good example of that. So you can still feel it and hear it and feel as it goes, boom. But the instruments are doing the actual transient work. 
as intended. I could probably have done it with a slower attack, but I didn't because this is a very busy mix already, so it's fine. When that initial hit comes in, if you had to deal with the impact being like the the main transient thing, then it actually wouldn't sound as good as the kick drum being the main transient thing on the top of the song. So these are all just little choices that had to be made. Also, this riser was a little bit too different from everything else. And instead of processing the bus more, I just uh, boosted the, the high end to give it more of like a wish. We're going to go into some crazy cool stuff. Uh, background vocals. I panned them. Here's where I get into the secret of uh, vocals, right? On every single one of these, I threw an optical style compressor. Embrace the fire, let the sparks ignite the night. With more of an LA-2A style timing, because I'll be honest, I actually don't record vocals anymore without really using a uh, an optical compressor on the way in. So I treated each of these tracks as if they had an opto on the way in. And so from this point on, all of these tracks have opto compression on them. So I'm not even going to bother pretending like I did anything more than just drag those on to give them a little bit more uh, consistency and volume level the way I like it. That's just purely a preference thing. So now I'm going to treat all of these as background vocals in the bus, starting with EQ. So first things first. Embrace the fire. I boosted it at 700 hertz because I've cut it everywhere else in the song, waiting for this exact moment for the background vocals to be here because I love how these vocals sound and I really want them to shine at this one specific, like that very musical sounding area, right? If I cut it too much, the background vocals just disappear. I also cut around here because this area the fire. is where the main vocals are going to be mostly primarily like the, the main forward thrust of the vocals is going to be in that area. So I, I, I didn't want that to interfere with them. Again, I want these to wrap around the main vocals. I don't want them to take away from them. I also cut at around 8K because that's primarily where the, the sibilance is, but also... But also that's where the main vocal is going to have a lot of uh, push. And then I boosted it like 10K by 7 dB because I wanted them to feel more airy. Embrace the fire, let the sparks ignite the night. Because there's really not much going up there. I really wanted to have a little bit more push there. Up next, a multiband compressor. This one I'm pretty much just using as like a tone, tone adjuster. Embrace the fire, let the sparks if I were to the night, rise from the ashes, up this is literally at this point just a tonal balancer, <laughs> like no lie. Uh, the attack is very fast on all of these bands here and super fast up here just to catch some sibilance if necessary while still boosting quite a significant amount. Uh, so this is like just shaping the tone to be more like this again uh, because I like it. But it's also less consistent with multiple tracks that go in and out. So having that multiband compression there isn't just another form of EQ. It's literally tonal control. Here I have the compression doing the vocal style, which again is probably just going to be four to one. Uh, literally doing the old super fast 1176 style thing. I'm not even going to deny it. This is basically just an 1176 preset. And I really don't care how much I'm compressing there because they go together well. I'm also using Saturn. Really pushing that presence and the treble. And driving it through clean tape, quote unquote. That way I get a little bit more push out of it. Also, doing that brought up a lot of the S's more. Embrace the fire, so I threw a de on it. Let the sparks ignite the night. Rise from the ashes. So now the background vocals are lispy, but I don't want them to be aggressive on the S's. Here's the delay. Embrace the fire. Let the sparks ignite Eighth note straight. 
little bit of ducking, scooped out where the main vocals are, boosted around 4.5K where I haven't boosted pretty much anything else, and high pass to 230 hertz, low pass at 6K. So now you've just got this pretty like... Now the background vocals are good. I really like how they sound, but you have to understand, I wanted them to sound perfect for this mix, and they are sounding perfect for the mix now. Also, I limited them. <laughs> Embrace the fire, let the sparks ignite the night. A very aggressive limiter to give it a little bit more breakup, because I use clean tape on the Saturn as opposed to like a more aggressive one, so I'm doing more aggressive limiting on it. Sometimes I'll very aggressively limit a uh, background vocal bus just because I feel like it helps clamp down on them and prevent them from stepping on the main vocals while also giving them their, their own unique sounding aggression. But that's just my opinion, man. So here's the background vocals. So you notice how they sit just slightly above the mix? That's the point. Let's do a AB. Very well recorded. But now they are very punchy and in your face and warm and wonderful and bright and ugh, I love those vocals. All right, on to the main vocals, because I could go on forever about these vocals. Did a decent amount of automation throughout the song, but thankfully it was mostly just one or two tracks the whole time, uh, alternating, so I, I appreciate that. Hi, your rise from the embers, my spirit will rise, I'll shadow the binding spells, and the forge of my soul, strength will be made, I'll find my destiny, I am the... Basically just cut this 700 with a dynamic EQ of about like 3 dB, primarily because that's where the background vocals are going to be. And I don't want this stepping all over the background vocals. I know that sounds silly because they're background vocals for a reason, right? But no, uh, I want the background vocals to wrap around you and that to do that, they need their own space. And that space is six to 800 hertz for me. Hi, you're rush from the also, just brightening a little bit at like 6K and a little shelf at 8K and above. The forge of my soul. Without. Will be made. I'll find my destiny. Now it feels a lot more forward, a lot more like, oh, this is intimate. It's a close performance. Again, tonal shaping with the multiband. Hi, your rise from the embers, my spirit will rise, I'll shadow the binding spells. And Very the fast attack, slowish soul. release, kind of 1176 made. style. 1176 I style compression, really going hard. Break the because I can. I am the going into Saturn, more aggressive distortion. Embrace the fire. Notice how saturated that sounds? Me too. Hard drive on the warm tape. Boosting the presence. A little bit of the mid. Notice how much more distorted it sounds, right? Yeah, thought so. Hi, from the embers. My spirit will rise. I shadow the binding spell. Strength will be made. I find my destiny. So now I'm cutting down on the S's really aggressively because they were too much originally. And especially with the background vocals, sometimes the S's can be a little bit aggressive. So here's the uh, delay that I have on it. Very similar to the other one, but boosting Hi, the frequencies I cut the from the other. Must be red, will Aggressive soul. ducking. Strength will be made. I find my destiny. I am the Zambas that will break the chains. I am. That way, when he's not singing, the delay goes really aggressively loud, and it just fills up that space in between uh, words, and I love it. And then from there, I aggressively limited. Hi, 
away your rise from the embers My spirit will rise A shadow the bite And not as much as you think but Embrace the fire Let the sparks ignite the night Rise Notice how distorted that is And how distorted it sounds But in context I rise from the embers My spirit will rise A shadow the bind spells And the forge of my soul Strength will be made I find my destiny It just has energy And I love it So up next I sent all of these things To a verb bus that I automated throughout the song Sometimes to be really uh Really powerful, like in this opening. 20 millisecond pre-delay, 4 second decay. This multi-band boy just cutting out all the lows below like 200 hertz almost. And then controlling the mid, low mids a little bit. Controlling the high mids less, but cutting them down. Uh, and then boosting the highs to just give it some like space, man. Without... With, with the limiter, fast attack, fast release, uh, and then I also am doing sidechain compression. So the this vocal actually is causing the reverb to be ducked below it for 200 milliseconds every time it gets signal from the original signal. So this main vocal sent to the verb bus twice. Once as the input signal, and then once as the sidechain. Notice how it just like, boom, comes right back in. That's especially useful during this section. And you hear it in context. It prevents it from feeling like it just dies off, but instead just fills the room because this is a suitably epic vocal. Speaking of suitably epic, we're actually up against the final part here. So listen to this. These are the octave vocals, right? So it's mostly low, low octaves, right? Except for the end when it's very high and I love it. So these are actually kind of one of the more difficult boys to do. This EQ is kind of all over the place. I treated them exactly the same as the background vocals, but even more aggressively uh, scooped here with the dynamic range being cut almost by 90 B at the very end. And I had to do that because otherwise it peaked out over the song like immensely. Look at that, it's like a huge difference. So I really tamed that and then just boosted some of the highs like I did with the backgrounds. Multiband compression, again, super controlling everything from 1K up to like 7K. On the rage, that balls inside. Because that <laughs> is a very high uh, siren whale. Compressing, 1176 style again. I'm not doing anything special here. It's just straight up the same thing over and over again. Saturn, clean tape, massive high boost. And then because I did all that high boost, I want to get the sibilance back down. DS it again the same exact way. And then delay with the same way that the background vocals were, but less duct so that it's more recessed into it. The ducking on here is pretty low. So it's not stepping on the delays when they're going head to head with the delays, so to speak. And then limiting. So if you drop that in with everything else here, Notice how the main vocal still has precedence, but if I EQ turned off the EQ for the uh, octave vocals here, All the stars, the fire, down the rage that 
notice how if I didn't control that exact frequency of that siren wail, it would not have gone under the main vocal. It would, in fact, peek out over the main vocal and step on it. So all in all, that's everything I did. One thing I did want to show is what happens if you take away all of the tape plugins I used and what kind of difference that makes, because it does feel pretty cumulative. You'll definitely notice it. Reach for the stars. That is no fire. See now the rage that burns inside. Basically, it made everything feel a little bit more smeared and a little bit more growly, and I really like that. And also, I was using it as a high-end boost on some of the stuff. So, like, the guitar tone definitely suffered from having the tape off, if only because it was also, like, a high boost. So, anyway, let's hear how this sounds, the whole mix, without any processing, and then I'll turn it all back on again. And with all the work we did. Yeah. Anyway, I hope that was a very informative walkthrough for you. It definitely took me a while to mix this because of there were so many layers and the production is just so good. I wanted to do as much little automation as I could to just make it like feel loved the whole way through. I hope you understand. Anyhow, my name is Phil from One Wall Studio. I mixed this track. If you want to check it out, check it out in the description. So give it a listen. Pre-save if you still have that option. Oh, maybe later, later but studio. eventually it'll have a great be. day. And if I don't see you next time, then where the heck did you go? <laughs> bye bye.